that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer together. We want to continue to remember pastor of Jericho Tabernacle, Brother Johnny Alvarado. He's been incubated and placed upon a, a ventilator. And we just pray that God would touch him. I know there's others in his family that are not feeling well. And we're just praying that God would touch that church. Right now, I don't believe they're able to even have services. So let's pray for Jericho Tabernacle and Brother Johnny Alvarado. There's many in our church who are traveling right now and some that are still sick. So let's just remember each need in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we are here tonight to see you. And we rejoice to be able to see you and others. As we look out upon the congregation and those that have gathered together, we see you, we see a testimony, we see the hand of God. And Lord, it encourages us. We're encouraged by the people that we fellowship with, those that gather together. And Lord, it's even more invigorating to feel your presence come while we worship and to sense your nearness to us. And Lord, just sensing, feeling that dynamic of seeing brothers and sisters and being encouraged and then worshiping and being more encouraged and feeling your presence, it builds an expectation to know that these, this, this fellowship and seeing one another and worship is building to the place to where you can come and take the bread of life and break it to us. So Lord, as we stand in your divine presence, we pray that you'd come, bless the scriptures that are read, the quotations that are shared. Lord, the burden that has been placed upon my heart as I express it, may you stand ready to quicken it to the believer's heart. It may be something that encourages us. Father, may it be something that instructs us. And I pray, Lord, that above all, may it be something that allows us to surrender and yield that you might have a greater preeminence in our individual lives. And that's what we long to see, Father, is not a more refined church service, not a, a better working church, Lord, but rather Christ in the individual heart coming to uh, it's an individual coming to maturity in their position, Lord. That's what we desire to cultivate, to facilitate. So tonight, Lord, each one of us as individuals are surrendered to you. Have your way, we pray, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's turn our Bibles to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, and we'll read verses 27 to 35. Luke chapter 24, verses 37 to 35. Again, we say Merry Christmas to all of you. It's so nice to have uh, many of you out to the house of the Lord. <clears throat> I know that it's a, a busy time. Uh, right now, and there's some that we're not able to be here, and there'll be more maybe not able around this weekend with the traveling, but we're glad that you're here tonight. Uh, we far exceed the scriptural uh, mathematics of where two or three are gathered, and so we can be confident that Christ is in our midst tonight and desires to speak to us, but we share holiday greetings with you uh, from my wife and I, from our family. We love each one of you dearly. We're so happy to be together. Luke chapter 24, verse 7, 27. And we're continuing on the subject of who is my neighbor. Uh, I felt perhaps maybe even tonight could be a climax or a culmination, but we'll just see Luke chapter 24, verse 27. This is on the road to Emmaus. Uh, somebody shared something with me today. A minister shared something with me. They said, we all want to be like Paul. We want to be on the road to demask us. <laughs> kind of clever. Luke chapter 24, but this is the road to Emmaus, verse 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he, Christ, expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh unto the village whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further, but they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it, and brake and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. You may be seated. As we've been ministering on the subject of who is my neighbor, asking ourselves that question, uh, uh, who is my neighbor? We could even be a question that we're asking ourselves as a church, who, who is our neighbor? 
And uh, I thought of even entitling the message tonight, but I, th I think we're going to be maybe uh, just a little bit more focused in a way to where this wouldn't be a, maybe the appropriate title, but this, the answer would be you are. Whoever, who is my neighbor, I, if I would asking myself, who's my neighbor, I would look at those near me, those I come in contact with, and I'd say, you are, and you are my neighbor. And uh, we've wanted to use this parable of the Good Samaritan as a means of challenging us uh, about our place and position within the community, within the, uh, the city, the, the, the county, the state that you live in, and also to ponder the role that you have within uh, a, a sisterhood of churches and those that you fellowship with. And a lot of ways it's to challenge certain prejudices and notions that we have and are really just bad habits that are really counterproductive to church because as a church, uh, you do, the, the, the mission and the goal ought to see that others are saved and others are healed and others are benefited by the gospel. And if we become too insular in our experience and even the way that we congregate and the way that we view fellowship, then the church is, no, is not effective any, any, beyond anything other than the activity that takes place within the four walls. And I believe with all my heart that church does not exist to stand there and point people to come and gather where we are, but rather it's a place that we assemble together where we are encouraged, enriched by the Word of God, enriched by fellowship and the presence of the Lord, and then we go out and we live our lives as families in such a way to where we make a difference in our homes and then we make a difference in our communities, our neighborhoods. And, and that's the way that we ought to be living. Not, this isn't the sum and substance tonight. Right. I don't mean to make any of you feel bad, but you have not climaxed tonight by coming to service. But rather, you've come to get something to feed your soul so that it makes, something, it makes a difference for you on Thursday. Right. And so we do not live to go to church. We go to church to live. Amen. And in coming to church, we receive something that feeds us, that sustains us, and then pushes us out into society. And that's where we want to make a difference. Right. And, we want to, and we want to touch people's lives. And we want, to, we want to live for others because that's eternal life. And those are just some of the themes that have been burning in our hearts over these last few months as we've ministered on this subject. And so I want to go back to the verses we were in, Luke chapter 10, verse 34. And these are the verses that we were in last time. And we took the journey of this Samaritan, how that he came to where he was. And we looked at this process of him humbling himself and the contrast to the priest and the Levite. And we read where it says, and he came and he went to him and bound up his wounds. And in the process of binding up the wounds, one of the elements to this or two of the elements was pouring in oil and wine. And it says and he set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. We identified this as our personal responsibility, our personal duty to love our neighbors as ourselves. Because Jesus, in answering the question of this lawyer, well, who is my neighbor? He could have just told the story. There was a man on the wayside and he was wounded and a priest went by him and he didn't do anything. And a Levite went by him and he didn't do anything. But the Samaritan came by and he helped him. And he could have just used very quick language to make the point. But Jesus is also identifying what it means to love your neighbor. And so he went through these steps of how he came to where he was and he went down to him and he bound his wounds and he poured in the oil, the wine, and he set him on his own beast and then brought him to an inn. And we're going to focus on that particular aspect of bringing him to an inn and took care of him. We all have an individual responsibility as Christians to live for others. And, in, 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 and we could say this in one sense, if all you can do is pray, pray. If all you can do is give, give, but say, Lord, I want to live for others. Use me for your glory. Let me be your hand extended. Let me be your eyes. Let me be your very heartbeat. Let me do something for others. And so we have a personal, individual responsibility to live for others. And the elements that is, that is used in binding up the wounds of this wounded one, this one who had been befallen by unfortunate circumstance. He uses oil, which Brother Bram types to the spirit, and wine, which he types as revelation. And we looked at how that these must be our personal possession. We must have the Holy Spirit. We must have revelation. And if we have the Holy Spirit and revelation, then we can be effective witnesses. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, it's very difficult to testify of the Holy Spirit. If you don't have revelation, it's very difficult to testify of the Word of God. But being possessors of a new birth experience, being possessors of revelation, then it's the source from which we minister, and then it also becomes the means by which we minister or the elements that we minister with. We have the Holy Spirit to give. We have the revelation to share. 
And it, so it not only becomes the very basis of your experience and the thing that inspires you, but it's something that you can inspire with and minister with. And it's those things that will minister to people's wounds, to the lost and the hurting. And so we were looking at our individual responsibility to love our neighbors as ourselves, to care, to minister, to be concerned for others. And so the Samaritan, if you look at verse 35, he has brought this, this man who is wounded, and this man who is left half dead, he brought him to an inn. And in taking him to the inn, this verse shows us that he didn't just drop him off, but it says, and on the morrow when he departed, it means he was there with him in the inn. He was there to look after him, to care for him. He brought him to a place that maybe he was familiar with, but this man wouldn't be familiar with. And he was there to help him acclimate. He was there to meet his needs. And then after he was, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host of the inn and said unto him, take care of him. And whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Now, if we looked at this parable, and now as Christ affords us an example, if Christ is viewed as the good Samaritan in this parable, then we must put ourselves in his footsteps. We must place ourselves in his example and realize that if Christ acted as the Samaritan in this example, then there's some measure by which we have to live our lives as the Samaritan. So we must be sacrificial, we must be a servant, we must give as Christ gave. But if we look at this as Christ now being the Samaritan who brought the wounded one to the inn, it's then Christ that commissions the inn and the keeper of the inn to serve this wounded sick one. So Christ does his part to take care of him. But now there's a commission, and I want to view this as a commission to the church to look after the lost, to look after the wounded, to look after the hurting and after the sick. It's something you've been commissioned to do, but he has not left you without resources. He gives you the pence that you need to minister with. Amen. We'd read this statement, I believe, last time, and I want to do it again just to see this pattern that we just raised Brother Branham is preaching a sermon and he's talking about these converts, those of you who've received the Holy Spirit, and he's identifying them. And he, I, he shows these ministers that are standing nearby. He says, all these ministers here were all just exactly the same. They're Bible believing, they're filled with the Holy Spirit, promoting the Word of God. And we want you to join their church so you can continue on. He goes, now it, they are the, the good Samaritan. He says, now the good Samaritan has come by, poured oil in the wound. But he's took you now, and he wants you to go to one of the inns here, the closest to you. Amen. Listen, Christ wants you to go to church. Right. And, and, and I say those things on a Wednesday night because you get like 100% amens. When you say Christ wants you to go to church, and everyone's like, yes, amen, we believe. And so Christ wants you to go to church. Uh, there's a danger in not being in fellowship. There's a danger in not being part of a body, a healthy body that can nurture you and that can fellowship with you and encourage you. So he says he wants you to go into these inns here, the, clo the closest to you. He's done paid the, pr the pastor to take care of you. So he's paid. And how is he paid? And I believe these, these should be viewed as uh, things that the church has, not just the pastor. He's received the Holy Ghost, got blessings of God and health and revelation. So God has given gifts to men, gifts to the church. He's given blessings for your use and your benefit. Mm -hmm. So when he says Christ wants you to go to church because he's given the pastor, he's given the innkeeper, he's given them blessings and health and revelation. It's not for the pastor. Right. It's not so he can look big and bad before the people, but it's something he has as a servant to give out to others that they might be strengthened and they might, might be ministered to. So he says they have the, he has Holy Ghost and blessings and health and revelation. He can just feed your soul. So you come now and join one of the churches and it will be the best thing you can do to keep your spirit fed and moving on. Now, if Brother Branham identifies this as one of the best things. It will be the best thing you can do to keep your spirit fed and moving on. First, we acknowledge that's because it's scriptural. And then we also have to recognize that this is something that Satan will fight against. So Satan is going to do everything he can to keep someone from going to church. Right. Uh, we recognize it in our own personal lives. He's going to do things to try to keep us from going. 
And for those uh, who maybe are in the practice and the habit of going, there's certain things that intervene uh, that keep us from being uh, making different services and being as consistent as we would like. And we are, we're able to overcome that and we fight through it and then we get back on track. And that's because we have a desire to be in service and we recognize Satan's fighting us. But then there's a, if I could just say this, and I wasn't maybe anticipated saying it this early. There's a lot of things about church that can keep people away from church. Yeah. You don't be that reason. Amen. It's a challenge. I don't ever want to be the reason that someone doesn't want to go to church. Because if we're not careful, we could be the very reason that people don't want to go to church. And church is the reason why people are missing church. Why? Because church has become something that church shouldn't be. So we should all, as individuals, labor and strive to create the right kind of atmosphere, to, to reach out in a particular way, and have the right kind of attitude towards sinners, towards the lost. To people, maybe there might be people you... That, that come and visit the church and you may know them for years. You're like, I've never really liked that person. You are now being challenged to humble yourself, find out why that's there and overcome it. Amen. That's right. Because Christ wants us uh, to be welcoming. Brother Branham says in Jezebel religion, he says, remember the good Samaritan that found the man wounded. He brought him to the inn. And Brother Branham says, that's the church. Right. So we've already seen how in the prior quotation, he says, that the, the, these pastors there, they're innkeepers. They've been gifted with things. They've been given things to look after those who are going to come to the end, come to a church, be a part of a church. And Brother Brown, again, here identifies the church as the end in the parable of the Good Samaritan. So when we are commissioned to love our neighbors as ourselves, then we have a resource available to us, that oil in revelation, the word, the spirit in revelation. We minister to our neighbors, those that we come in contact with, our family members. But then we also have a place that we can invite them to come. And in coming, God continues the ministry, continues the serving, and continues to work to see that the person is not just told the truth, but by the truth made free and made whole. So it's not, it's not all upon you. And sometimes we do take that responsibility. I, I'm trying to answer these questions and I'm trying to get this person to see. And I've been witnessing to my coworker, and I've been witnessing to this person. I've been trying to get them to see. Well, God has a place that you can bring them. And, and you don't have to worry about what's preached and what's sung. There's a, there's a dynamic about this place, about this inn, where God will deal with hearts as he pleases. And it's wonderful to be a part of a church where you're happy to invite somebody to it. And I believe that we ought to be excited to invite people to witness of this great truth that we have and welcome them to church. And you can literally tell them, come to the inn. Right? Because we're meeting in a hotel right now. You can tell them, come to the inn. Come to a place. But the man says, he brought him to the inn. That's the church. And gave the man there two pence. Told him that if he needed any more, he'd pay him when he'd come. So he's got two pence. He's able to doctor you up if he's a man of God. If he's a man of God that stands on the word of God, he's got what God give him, the spirit and the word. So we're looking at this, this dynamic of how we have this individual personal responsibility to live for others. And we would do that outside of these four walls. We would do that outside of our just going to church. But then in coming, but then and being a part of a body and part of a church, we now as a church collectively have a responsibility to care for the ones that the individuals are ministering to. So that we, we help, we assist, we, do, we look into what we can do to help. And we, we provide, by virtue of our church services, a, a, a place of safety and a place of comfort where the lost, the hurt, and the wounded could come and be healed. And it's our love for others then that would compel us to guide them to the end. And we saw last time how Brother Man says, you, you want to get in there, put your shoulder to the wheel, do all that you can and serve. So we have a role that we play within the church. We should be praying and asking God. Uh, it, it, I would say not just even within the church, but asking God, show me my purpose. Show me my position. Let me do all that you want me to do. Amen. And I believe that we all have a part to play within the local assembly. Brother Branham says in the message, doors and door. He says, every door open. Uh, and, and, and even in your heart, oh, just touch the little button and watch them all go right around the circle. Say, come in, Lord Jesus. Be my Lord and all. Lord, uh, my Lord, my all. And he continues to sing, oh, let me from this day. Not let you stand at the door, be holy thine. And he says, you that raised your hands and wants to be farther led towards the Lord. I ask you to go down to the revival tonight. 
And I'm sure the pastor there would take you from here to the inn. He has six pence. Whatever was given, it was two pence to take care. The oil and the wine to pour in. He can finish the job. And that's the function of the church, not just the pastor. Because if the pastor could just finish the job, then maybe you just, hey, this is where I live. I'll give you my gate code or whatever. You come, come see me. And you come to me and I'll finish the job. But it's something we do as the body. It's something that the, that even a, a genuine pastor realizes you're not all here because of him. He's here because of you. Right? right? That's the only reason why a, a pastor is where he is, is because there's people there that need ministry. And so he is dependent upon the people. He realizes the only reason why I'm here is because there's the people of God need to be ministered to. And I'm a servant and I have a gift. So God used this gift for the people's benefit. And so it's not just the pastor, because I don't believe churches should be pastor centric. It should be word centric and Christ centric. And so in reading this statement, it's just merely to identify that we as a church have the elements and the dynamics to bring people to the end and be ministered to by Jesus Christ. He says, I'm sure he would take you here to the end. It speaks of the church and the church then is equipped to see that the job that Christ started is finished. Because Christ is going to do it. He's going to finish it. And he's asked us to be co-laborers with him in that process. Brother Branham, again, I'm just using these statements to show that we as a church should identify ourselves in this parable of the Good Samaritan, wherein the question is answered, who is my neighbor? And the question is answered, what does it mean to love my neighbor as myself? We are identified in this parable as the end. In the message, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's talking about his meetings in Bombay, Italy. He said recently, or excuse me, Bombay, in India. Recently, there was no way of seeing. We couldn't get the churches to cooperate. Because of the cooperation, we went under another church, and some of the churches were down on them, and that started the rest of them to down this group. Isn't that a shame? Just a shame. But the people come anyhow. Amen. It's such a, it says, it's such a bad thing. If we can get the ministers to cooperate so that the man, when he's converted, he can have a church home to go to. He says, if you turn him back... Turn him back out into the devil's pig pen, then he'll come right back again just like he was. But if you've got a place that you can direct him to, some good, and then this is where he comes again to the inn. Like Jesus with the Samaritan, he taken him to the inn. He said the good Samaritan taken the fallen man to the inn. He says, we've got to have a place like that. And I would encourage you to be in a place where you can do just that. You, you don't want to be a, uh, you do not want to have the kind of experience where you drag yourself to church because you got to check that box. Because in the back of your head, you know, Brother Branham said that a believer will be there when the church doors are open. It's like, ah, oh, church doors are open. I guess I need to be there. But you want to have a place like Brother Branham's identifying here. A place where you can send somebody to. He says, and you can have a church home to go to. So it's not just a church, it's a church home. What is home? What, kind of, what does it mean to have a home? It's a place that evokes thoughts of safety and comfort and belonging and family and nurturing. Home should not conjure up images of abuse and threatenings and manipulation and control. Home should conjure, conjure up images of warmth and safety, something inviting, something welcoming. And we ought to be those that are identified in the scripture as a Samaritan together with Christ, where we have a place that we can bring people to. And it's all of our responsibility to have the right kind of attitude, create the right kind of atmosphere to see that this can be a home church. Amen. Not just a church, but a church home. He says, but you've got to have that place to direct somebody to. He says, we've got to have a place like that. Let it be our prayer as Arizona Believers Church. Lord, make this place like that. Amen. Make it a church home. Make it a place that even an inn, and, I, and we ought to be unselfish in this way. Lord, even if it's an inn, that means it's a place that someone comes for a time to rest and be strengthened. And then God would take them and place them somewhere else. We can rejoice in that. We can rejoice that even if for a season, God would let our body minister to somebody and then he would take them and place them somewhere else, use them for his glory somewhere else or put them in, a, in another place where they could be ministered to and taken further. We rejoice in that. Amen. Oh, God, our prayer, make us, make us that kind of place. Brother Bram says, and God hath provided a way, God hath provided a way, or hath the way provided. I might have missed a, a letter there in the title. He says, like the traveler that fell coming from Jericho, from Jerusalem to Jericho, and they took him to the inn. 
the little provided place. And they poured some oil in and give some money and he got well. Let's, I believe God, this would be my, my, my conviction and I don't like to share my, my testimony or my conviction or my opinion, but I will say this, my conviction is this is a little provided place. And maybe you could testify for yourself that God has given you some healing and poured in some oil and wine and been ministered to. But this is our thought process as the church. Let us be a little provided place for the weary traveler. Let us be a place where people can come and hear the word of God preached and fellowship with others who have a Christ-like spirit. There's there's no judgment. There's no condemnation. There's no arrogance. There's no belittling. There's no elitism that comes with it that we've torn down walls of cliques and social constructs that separate people and God let us be a place where uh, whatever ethnicity whatever background whatever struggle whatever difficulty they have that it's not our dynamic personalities but it's the preeminence of Christ that makes people feel welcome you may be somebody that's very wealthy and you can live luxuriously and you have nice things but if you're Christ-like in your spirit then the poorest person could come and rub shoulders with you and say that's somebody that I like and somebody I can benefit from you don't have to all have the same social background and the same opinions on certain things and all love to eat at Rito's or all of us wear the same kind of clothes. But it's the nature and the spirit of Christ that becomes the magnetism that draws people. So we don't try to just create a church where everyone dresses the same, everyone acts the same, and everyone does the same thing, and everybody buys the same things because, of, oh, oh, is that what he drives? That's what I want to drive. Oh, that's where he eats. That's where I want to eat. But we, so we don't want to all just become a commune where we all have things in common, and that's what begins to bond people together. But let it be the preeminence of Christ that becomes the magnetism. Therefore, all men, all men can be drawn unto him. A little provided place. In the scripture, Romans chapter 15, verses 5 to 7. I hope this can can just mean something more to you, though they're familiar. But just kind of let it strike you a little bit differently. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. We ought to have the mind that he had. And we ought to have the same attitude towards the sinner, towards the weak, towards the lost, towards the hurting, and, and even toward the, the arrogant and blind. We ought to have the same attitude towards them, that we be like-minded one toward another according to Christ. So he's talking about our attitude towards others, the way that we perceive others, our knee-jerk reactions to others. He says that you may be with one mind, in one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there must be unity, there must be harmony selfishness breaks unity selfishness builds walls makes you eat you could even be within a church very selfish and you just build walls around yourself and he says in verse 7 wherefore receive ye one another as Christ also received us to the glory of God welcome one another be inviting to one another Uh, Be hospitable to one another. Receive ye one another. He says, so we're welcoming. We're being hospitable. We're opening up ourselves to one another. He says, as Christ, as Christ also received us. Woo, there goes every excuse, right? As Christ also received, what did he receive you? In your own arrogance, in your own ignorance. If we could maybe uh, bring everybody into that fellowship, maybe just not a couple of us, but in your own weakness and sin, in your own confusion, in your hurting, in your imperfection, in your brokenness. Christ received you in your brokenness. Christ received you in your hurting. Christ received you in your confusion. Christ received you in the state that you were in when you turned. And likewise, we can, as the church of God, we can do as Paul says, receive you one another as Christ received you. I can take you as you are. But I've got the goods and I've got something by a gift of God as a church, as a believer. I've got oil, I've got wine, I've got blessings, I've got health, I've got revelation. You don't have to stay the way you are. There's something that we've got where God can mend brokenness. He can deliver, He can set free. We stand confidently as ones that bear this power, bear this, uh, this ministry to see that others are saved and others are healed. So Brother Branham identified as the two pence, healing and salvation. We've got it. Do you have it? 
You have it. Let me, when I say we, I'm not using the royal we as an I. I'm using we as in all of us who are here. All of us who are part of this fellowship. We have it. The bride of Christ. She has these things. The healing and the salvation. It's a beautiful type in there. He says, and if you need more, this will I bring when I come. The church has had healing and salvation, but in this last day, she needed something to take rapture in faith. And he's come. And he's given us the more and the opening of the word to get us out of here. Such beautiful types contained in these scriptures. Now, so he says, we are to receive one another. We're like-minded towards one another as according to Christ. And wherefore, we're to be welcoming. We're to be inviting to one another. In Hebrews chapter 13, verses 1 to 3. Now, I, I share this to challenge us. Because we're very quick to make certain calculations. I had a, a brother share with me, uh, a very dear friend, who said that he realized that he was very quick to assess somebody and essentially place a value on them. And I realize I'm kind of using my own words right now. And then very quickly determine just how much time he wants to invest in them. And he said the Lord was just really shattering those notions of how quickly we just calculate these things and say, well, it's probably not worth the effort. Listen, it's all worth it. Yes, we use wisdom to not cast our pearl before swine. And we use wisdom to not caustically share the gospel to condemn somebody. And we want to use wisdom in the way that we share it. And, and we ask God to guide us and to lead us. But listen, the efforts that you take to see that someone could just be delivered from something or they have a confusion a remedied and, and their lives just made better and made easier and our marriage restored, it's worth every effort. Amen. And not make some... Uh, just some decision that, well, if it doesn't result in this, it's not worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it to labor. In Hebrews chapter 13, verses 1 to 3, it says, Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain, to invite, to welcome. And I believe in one place it says, allow them to lodge. And if we look at it as a church, it will allow those to come and remain tarry. He says, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. We can be very quick to kind of assess somebody and kind of get an idea, well, this is where I think they're at and this is where I, what I think they're worth. And the Bible actually tells us to let brotherly love continue and be not forgetful to entertain strangers because you never know when it's an angel that you're ministering to. And so, so then we have to we have to have this maybe as a constant reminder. Lord, I don't ever I, I, I never have license to mistreat anyone. Amen. I know we've mentioned that many, many times. You, there's no place in the scripture where it says where we're told be Christ like and be forgiving and be be uh, uh, be humble and serve. And then it says, except when this and then you can be unchrist like. Are we always trying to figure out, Lord, when, it, when, when can I braid this whip? I've been carrying this thing with me. I want to know when I can flip over tables and toss out the money changers. I want to know when I can do that. Now, let's not look for those opportunities. Let, let's look for opportunities to serve and humble ourselves and do what we can to render aid and, and to minister to somebody. Because the Bible is saying, don't be afraid. Don't be forgetful to minister to one, to tarry with somebody, to give strength to them. He says, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares, not even knowing, but they've ministered to angels. He says, remember them that are in bonds as bound with them. So now you're putting yourself in their shoes. In them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. Serve by putting yourself in their position. If they're in bonds, remember them that are in bonds as if you were in bonds with them. Those that are suffering adversity be, as being also with them in the body. Uh, maybe just to bring it into current events. Uh, maybe there's some of us who uh, heard that a, someone we knew or someone we loved ha had COVID-19. We said, well, we're praying for you. And then you got it. And then after that, when you found out somebody hey, says, I'm praying for you. Why? Because you could empathize. You could put yourselves, yourself in their shoes and you realize, hey, man, I'm praying a little bit differently than I was praying uh, March through uh, July. I, I'm praying a little bit differently than I was before. Why? Because you have the ability then to empathize with what they're going through. And Paul is saying, let's labor if we can to be empathetic. If someone's in bondage of sin, hey, which one of you was it? 
Right. So that we can pray for them as having been one that was bound. Let us never forget what we were. I was reading in the scripture uh, in the God hiding himself in simplicity today. And Brother Branham was talking about how there was no room for Jesus at the end. And we're going to at the end and we're coming to that here in a moment. And he was saying there he was in a manure filled barn and he's born in a manger and he's born in this and he's born in that. And, and there's no room for him. And he's turned out and rejected. And he says, but it, there's but he came. It came to something later is kind of what it refers to. And, and as Christ comes to his glory and he comes to his majesty, but we should never forget the origin of it, how it begins in humility. And may we never, none of us ever forget what we've come from. Amen. That remember our humble beginnings. You say, oh, so I could always be beat over my head so that I could always be under the bondage of it so I could hover over me as a shadow. No, you look back on it victoriously. You look back on it as being made more than a conqueror. You look back at it as somebody says, that is what I've been brought out of. You're looking down at the pit. You're looking down at what once tormented you and what's haunted you. Just as the scripture says, the, the whole world, the, the saved and redeemed will look back at Satan and say, this is what tormented us. You're looking back as a conqueror. And in looking back and remembering what you came from, when you see somebody else who's befallen by the same thing, you can then wit enter into ministry and to empathetic prayer say, Lord, I know what they're going through. Amen. I understand their pain, their bondage, and how they could be so overwhelmed with something. And if we don't forget that we were there before, then we can look on it with compassion instead of, ugh, so typical. Well, they asked for it. Remembering them. We can entertain angels underwear. We need to receive one another, be welcoming. What does Jesus say in Matthew 25, 40? Because he said there's those that are going to enter into glory on, at the day of white throne judgment. And he's going to say, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was sick, you, you ministered to me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in bonds, you visited me. And the people are going to go, when? When did we do that? And he says, in so much as you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. Do you realize then how that if there's those who are going to enter into life on that day for the, the way that they ministered to the body of Christ, as Brother Brown uses the phrase that we're good to the bride, then you realize that we likewise have that responsibility. That we're not just living for somebody. We're not just, uh, when it says love thy neighbor as thyself, and we think, oh, well, I've got to do that to this unbelieving, cruel, you know, and we go through all this list of reasons why we don't think we should love. No, you don't know who you're witnessing to. You don't know who you're ministering to. In so much as you've done unto these, the least of my brethren, you've done it unto me. So we read last time, brother, it says, whatever you do to somebody, you're doing it unto Christ. Do you remember that? Whatever you do to somebody, you're doing it unto Christ. If you lie about them, you're lying about Christ. If you're hurtful towards them, you're hurtful towards Christ. Well, Brother Aaron, they, they've flat up told me they don't believe the Bible. They flat out denied. Well, I witnessed to them about the message, and they said it was a bunch of nonsense, and I'm in a cult, and they even cussed about Brother Branham, and they said this about Christ, and they did this, and they did that. Whatever you do to them, you're doing it unto Christ. I, I almost feel like I could have just come tonight and just kind of shared that and played a game of telephone and made it go through and make sure everybody got it. And if we really sat there and pondered it, we'd just be like. <gasps> and we kind of all leave going, I got to go home. I mean, if it really, really struck us, the full weight of it washed over us. And you'd be like, I really owe that cashier at Dollar Tree an apology. Hey, I really owe, I owe that person in the drive through at Chick-fil-A an apology. Because whatever you do to them, you're doing it unto Christ. Would that not change everything? You're on the phone with Amazon customer support. Listen, I'm telling you, buddy. And you're, Wait a minute, I'm talking to Christ. Hold on. I, I, if, and you realize this is just maybe some best practices. Do you realize if you, if you tell somebody, I'm at your mercy, I know you have control, I know this is at your discretion, I'm coming to you, I'm asking you because I know you're the person who can help me. That you just could completely change the dynamics. So you're actually speaking to the one, whatever you do to somebody, you're doing it to Christ. You're, you're acknowledging, you're humble yourself to somebody on the other end of the phone. And you're empowering them to get the, what you need done instead of saying, hey, listen, buddy. 
I've been buying from you guys for three weeks now. You realize how much money I spent? $23.40. And if you don't treat me right, you're going to lose a customer, buddy. I mean, like, so long, bye-bye. Right? They're just, see ya. Not to scare anybody, but you know why they have all these reward programs? They want to find out who's shopping and not making them money. And I think one day the door's just going to be locked when we show up. You're always buying on clearance and returning. We don't want you in here anymore. But, my, but the, coming back, let's get back on track here. Just the season, season of returning, giving. I've often said if you don't believe in return ministry, my wife has one. <laughs> but whatever you do to somebody, you're doing it unto Christ. This ought to be instructive to us. As I pondered these things and was coming, I, I just loved how the, the momentum of this came to this place. As we identified the church as the end in this parable. In Luke chapter 2, as we read Sunday, here it comes this season uh, of what we now know to be. Uh, we call it Christmas season. But in that time, they were to come together to be taxed. And as, as they are, the days of uh, Mary's come to accomplish to be delivered. In verse 7, Luke chapter 2, verse 7, she's with child. And, and Joseph had to come uh, to Bethlehem. It, to be, everyone had to come to his own city to be taxed. And it says, and there when she comes to the town, and, and the story is dramatized and told. I actually came across a statement where Brother Bram says, I know everybody preaches this time of year that there's no room at the inn. He says, so I'm going to go a different direction. I thought, wait a minute. I, I, I want to mention that tonight. And, and I didn't take it as a, a, a big stop sign. But it is common. No room at the end, no room at the end. So we understand how it's dramatized that families are coming into the city and maybe being late to come uh, for this time to be taxed. They're going to inn after inn and lodge after lodge and place after place. And there's no place for Joseph and his pregnant wife to lodge. There's no place like there was even for the Samaritan and the wounded man when he came in. They would have had a bed and would have had a place for them to sleep. But it says that she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, uh, uh, garments that were fit for animal use, and laid him in a manger. This is not, not a crib. This is not a bed. It says because there was no room for them in the inn. Now we realize that those in that day were not uh, being told the Messiah is, uh, uh, she's carrying the Messiah, will you make room for him? It wasn't put in those terms, but yet we take from that the, the example that was said in this scripture and the type that Christ is not always welcome. There was no room, he was not welcome, there was no place made. And this should challenge us as a church. That as we are told that we shall to be like-minded one toward another, receive you one another as Christ receive you. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers because you may be entertaining angels. And in so much as you've done unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done unto me. We ought to be welcoming and inviting and create an atmosphere that others, when they come, they can be ministered to and helped and encouraged while they're here. And we cannot do that unless Christ is welcome. There's a lot of effort made sometimes with in nominal Christianity and modern Bible churches to try to make a place real hip and real cutting edge and real welcoming to people so that they can feel like, hey, I, this, is, this is groovy. I like this. I can get along with this. this is, I really like the cut of your jib, pastor. This is a place that I can get, be comfortable in. But they have not welcomed Christ. And the only way that we can make a church a place where a difference can be made is if we welcome Christ. Brother Bram says in the deity of Jesus Christ, today the church has soup suppers, pie suppers. See who can dress the best. Go into the church for pomp, glory. Who's the best church, the best seats? Who can play this? Who can do that? Let it challenge us as a church that we never get into these, these metrics and ways of judging things when we're looking at the amenities and the worship and the, and the instrumentation and the syncopation of the choir and how fat they get on that in the bridge. and all this. Let's get all that out of our minds. That's not what's going to make this church a difference maker. It's Christ is going to be the one that's a difference maker. Soup suppers, pie suppers, who can dress the best, go into the church for pomp, glory, who's the best church, the best seats, who can play this, who can do that, and no room. No room for who? Christ. All the times they got, all times they got something else to do besides prayer. They can't pray anymore. They got something else to do. They can't pray anymore. They just can't serve God like they used to. No room for him in the end. And this is the end time, friends. No room for him in the end. He says, of course I know what that end meant. 
But I've been referring to this end. What is he talking about? The church. Just as the church is the end in the parable of the Good Samaritan, the church is represented here in Luke chapter 2, verse 7. The end had no room for him. He says, I, and he's now rebuking the church and challenging the church. He says, there's no room for him in the end. I'm referring to this end. And he makes a very, very striking reference. And if you want to go back and read it, it's in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Brother Bram is quoting verses 5 and 6. You can read those first several verses there and how there's um, nothing better for a man. And, and he's talking about the vanity of man and his labor and his work and what it ends up in. And then Brother Bram takes this and places it in his rebuke of the end. But the Bible said, in that day when the almond tree shall flourish, the desire of men shall fail because he goes to his long home. And this is a phrase that was referring to death, to the grave. And the mourners go about the streets, and the civil cord be broken, or the pitcher broke in the fountain. We know Brother Branham comes back later and refers to churches as being broken cisterns, and they're stagnant, old, stale, traditional, bound by ideas and, the, and humanism, the broken cisterns. And he uses this scripture in references to churches being an end, and it's speaking, the scriptures are speaking of vanity and death. And what does Brother Branham identify? Your church becomes one of these long rooms, one of these broken cisterns where it's death. There's no life to be given out. There's no health. There's no revelation. There's no real ministering taking place because it becomes very staid, very traditional, very structured, very rigid, and it becomes very humanistic. And when that happens, Christ is not welcome. In Christ not being welcome, there's not the life giver, the health giver, the savior, and the healer there to do what he can do. What a profound scripture for him to inject in this rebuke of the ends. And I believe that we make Christ welcome by making others welcome. Christ is welcome if we are welcoming to others. Our atmosphere must be Christ-like. Creating the right kind of atmosphere. As I read in Luke chapter 24 in the beginning, I'll narrow it down to verses 28 to 31. These disciples of Christ are heartbroken and they're discouraged and they're walking along the road back home and Christ draws near to them and he's like, man, why are you guys so sad? Why are you so gloom? And they go, man, have you not heard? Are you a stranger? Have you not heard what happened about Jesus and a man mighty of God and, and a man believed to be the Messiah and after it's been three days since he's dead and now they go to the, the, the tomb and he's empty and Christ rebukes them. Oh, fools and slow of heart. Why? Because he heard them rehearsing words back to him that he had spoken in three days. Told them. That ought to have been things that clicked for him, things that happened. They were going along discouraged. He says, and they drew nigh unto the village, and he opened up the scripture to them and expounded to them Christ. He says, and they drew nigh unto the village whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. What is that? It's, kind of, it's, it's a situation where it's kind of like, ah, well, eh, I'm not really interested. I'm going to keep going. You guys, you guys have fun. I'm not interested. You guys go. You guys can go in. I, I, I'm not really interested. But then it says, but they constrained him, saying, abide with us, for it is toward evening. Now, Brother Bram takes this, and we often think that it's that, uh, we use it as their house, and this is one of these disciples' homes, and he goes in, and this is the... This is where one of them would have lived. But Brother Branham takes it in several places and he says this was an inn that they were coming into for the night because it was getting too late and they had a longer journey and they needed to stop for the night. So as the night was coming on, they say, abide with us for it's towards evening. The day is far spent and, and, and it's, we can't keep traveling now. Now's the time to stop. And because they constrained him and said, remain with us, tarry with us. In other words, why don't you stay the night with us? Let's come in. Let's tarry together tonight. It says, and he went in to tarry with them. He kind of acted like he didn't want to go. But they weren't, they weren't happy with that, uh, with that. They wanted more. They wanted to implore more. They wanted to take the extra step. And they constrain him. No, abide with us, Terry. And it came to pass as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and break and gave to them. And their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight. And how is it this very, how is it it came to this place? This would not have happened had he said, no, I'm not, I, you know, I'm good. I'm going to keep going. And they said, all right, your loss. Right? Their eyes would have never been opened. 
They would have never had a message to go to the eleven and those that were with them and say, he's risen and appeared to Simon. They would have still been just as confused and even more confused. Like, man, that was amazing. This guy just talked to us and all these scriptures. and It was remarkable. But it's when they came, when he constrained them to stay in the inn. Come, abide with us, tarry with us. It's then that there was this fellowship that happened. And in the breaking of the bread, he was made known to them. In the placing of the word of God. And Brother Branham says, and who is this Melchizedek? But still they never recognized it. All day long they walked with, with you and still didn't know you. But night come, they constrained you to come in. And when they went into the little inn and closed the doors, then you did something just the way you did before your crucifixion. And they recognized it was the risen Christ. He said in another place, those very words, it wasn't until they came into the inn. It says, when you, when they came into the little inn and closed the doors, that's where the revelation was opened up to them. In the message, when their eyes were opened, they knew him. Notice, here's the thing to do. The next thing we find out, they invited him to come in. He got to the little place, the little inn where they were going to stay. It was towards the evening. They said, oh, come and abide with us. He made out like he was going on past. Oh, I thought that many times. He's only wanting you to invite him. He made out like he would pass them on by. He might make out like he's going to pass you by, sister in the wheelchair. Or you, sir, in the cot. Or you out there with heart trouble that can't live but just a little while longer. These people are perhaps crippled. They might live an ordinary lifetime. But somebody out there with heart trouble might die before the morning, might die before tomorrow. He might act like he's going to pass you by. But he's only wanting you to invite him. That's what he's wanting you to do. It might even seem like, God, you're straying a little bit. But he's wanting to say, Jesus, oh, God, come to my defense. Come to my aid. Come to my need. He's wanting you to invite him. Amen. To welcome him. I, I, it just this, this thought keeps coming in my mind. As I was looking at this on the parallel paths, we want to welcome Christ. We want to invite Christ. He may seem to want to pass us by, but we're compelling, Lord. No, come. That's why we come 30 minutes early, because we're praying, Lord, come, visit us today. And we're praying for those that we know have needs. We're praying for those that we know need something. Oh, God, be mighty. God, come and, and step upon the scene, Lord. Do use, use the song service, Lord. Be with the minister who, as he preaches. You say, oh, Lord, I know he has a tendency to veer off this way. So, Lord, you just take him. Bind him close to the burden that you've given him. And we're praying and we're creating an atmosphere. And we're welcoming and we're inviting. That's the very purpose for song service. To wash our conscience. To create an atmosphere. To let the Holy Spirit come by. Because we want to welcome Christ so he can what break bread and in the breaking of bread be made known to us but then there's also on the along the same path we're wanting to welcome others we're wanting to be inviting we want to be something that compels someone to say this is the place where I know I can get something that I need and here recently I was fellowshipping with a young man and I I said to him as he was talking and he was asking questions and I said well um, why, don't you, why don't you take my number down and if you want to ever reach out or uh, come visit the church, you know, you could, you could come. Uh, uh, and the conversation just continued. And I was like, well, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not going to say, well, do, don't you want my number? It's a really catchy one, 0123. I mean, you, you might really like it. But I just, uh, I, I thought, well, we just continue to open up and witness and, and share some things. And then all of a sudden he just said, can I have your number? I want to go to church. And I could have taken offense right there at the beginning. I could have been like, oh, you don't want my number? Mm-hmm. Well, I got to go. I, but it was like, there was a constraining. There was a He made as though it didn't really matter to him. And sometimes it could be that with people. I'm not interested. I don't know. But let's not just be so quick to give up. If you know somebody's hurting, you know somebody's lost, you know you've got the more that they're looking for. You know you've got something that can minister to their needs. Don't be so quick to just let them go. But say, oh God, let me tarry with them. Let me constrain them. Tell them, come abide, come to the end. that you can get what you need. Amen. He says, you might act like, he might act like he's going to pass you by, but he's only wanting you to invite him. You might think, well, he's healed so-and-so the other day. Last month, two years ago, I seen, yeah. He might act like he's going to pass you by, but he's only wanting you to invite him. He makes out like he's going to pass. What he was then, he is today. What he does then, he does today. 
He said so. Notice, you must do the same thing. You've got to invite him in. It was then and only then that he could reveal himself. Listen, it was then and only then. Yes, the journey was important. Yes, it laid a tremendous foundation. But when they constrained him to come into the end, to come into the place where the word could be rightly divided, it was then, then that he revealed himself. And it's instructive to us to invite him. Invite him into your family situation. Invite him into your work situation. Invite him into your health needs. Invite him. Welcome him. He's waiting to be invited. And Christ, let me say this, Christ needs to be welcome here. In this physical gathering, in our church, in our fellowship, he needs to be welcome. And as, if, as we make Christ welcome and we welcome others, we are not inviting people to a church experience. If you want a church experience, there's better church experiences out there. They got a lot more programs, a lot better things to offer, a lot better light show. Right? You know, a, a lot more, you know, hip, hip uh, choir and worship bands and everything. There's, just, there's a lot of church experience out there. You can get better. But what you want is you don't want people to have a church experience. You want them to have an experience with Christ. And it's our attitude. It's our expectation that we have when we come to church. We come to church and we're just, uh, it's our expectation that creates an atmosphere. It's our vision, what we come wanting to accomplish, what we're going to do. All that projects Christ to the people. If we're humanistic, if we're carnal, if we're bitter, if we're upset, and, there, uh, and there's grudging and all different things, if there's the wrong motive and objective, then we come, we're projecting that. And people will come and visit, be like, yeah, I just didn't feel welcome. And then we're very quick to be like, well, that just kind of shows what they're made of. I, let, let's, let's, let's challenge ourselves. If we're ever rebuked, if we're ever corrected, if anyone who even is an unbeliever ever has something negative to say to us, let's first examine ourselves before God and say, God, was it warranted? Did I give them reason to believe that I would lie? Did I give them reason to believe that I didn't have their best interest in mind? Oh God, let it not be true what they had to say about me. It'd be amazing what you can accomplish when you can humble yourself to somebody and say, I'm sorry. And they're like, oh, I kind of half expected you to really let me have it. What's the goal? That they could see Christ. Our attitude, our expectation, the way we behave, it projects Christ to people. So we must create a welcoming atmosphere for Christ. We must create that kind of atmosphere for Christ and for those who need him. Brother Branham says in the message, God hiding himself in simplicity. Now I think it's our duty. He's talking about the church and the remodeling of the church and how beautiful the church was and how nice it had become. He says, now I think it's our duty to make the inside right by the grace of God. Whose duty is it? It's your duty. It's your duty. It's your duty to make the inside right. The inside, the atmosphere. The, 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 the way people feel. The way people interact. He says it's our duty. We have that duty. We say, oh Lord, I showed up at church. I'm here. I'm 30 minutes early. We're two or three are gathered in my name. There you'll be in the midst. You come on, do it, Lord. Make it dynamic. Make it inviting. Make it welcoming. No, it's our duty to do it. Amen. By humbling ourselves. He says this will just not only be a beautiful building that we'll come to, but may everyone who comes in see the beautiful characteristic of Jesus Christ in every person that comes in. That's what we dress ourselves in before we walk through that door. Lord, let me, be, let me portray the beautiful characteristic of Jesus Christ. We don't know who's going to be visiting us today. Lord, I don't know who's going to be coming amongst us. I don't know who I might run into in the foyer. I don't know who I might come in contact with after church. But Lord, may I be dressing in the beautiful characteristic of Jesus Christ that everyone who sees me will see something different. Be salty. May it be a consecrated place to our Lord, a consecrated people. Let us be a provided people in a provided place. Brother Ben, I'm called the end, the little provided place. I want to be a little provided person in that little provided place. He says, may it be a consecrated place to our Lord, a consecrated people, for no matter how beautiful the structure is, that we certainly do appreciate, the beauty of the church is the character of the people. Amen. That's right. I trust it will always be a house of God. Of beauty. 
By what? The character of the people. Brother Branham says, and God provided way for this day. God's provided way for this day. I did that resonate with you? The beauty of the church is the character of the people. And it's our duty to make the inside right. Where Christ would feel welcome. God's provided a way for this day. He says, remember, the education wouldn't be the instrument to lead them to God's provided place. And he's using the example, and he comes to it here in a second, how those ducks, how when they, when they go to hibernate, when they go to, uh, to, uh, to migrate at a particular season, that there's an instinct in the leadership. Education wouldn't be the instrument to lead them to God's provided place. The instrument they have is instinct. Them ducks know that the instinct will take them to God's provided place. So does the Holy Spirit take the church to God's provided place. Now, the reason why this quote struck me to be used here is to challenge the idea if I have portrayed it all in my enthusiasm for inviting people to church, in my enthusiasm for saying that this inn is a place that people can come to receive healing and salvation, if in any of that it has gotten out of balance to seem that I'm making Arizona Believers Church and wherever they gather and that church something special about that place, about the building or about the, about the fact that it is a church and make church more preeminent than the Christ that the church serves and the Christ that the church is welcoming and the Christ that the church is ministering. This quote helps orient us again to realize this is we are not a church-centric people. We are a Christ-centered people. And it's Christ that draws us to worship. It's Christ that we're gathering around. It's Christ that has the preeminence. Really, honestly, seriously, if it was just about church, go to any church. Yeah. A lot of people think we're crazy. And they say, you drive how far? Go to church. How many churches did you pass on your way to that church? Like, are they not all preaching Christ? Are they not all lifting up? He said, but no, no, it's not just about church. It's a church home. It's a place I belong. It's a place where Christ is welcome and I'm a part of what God is doing. I, I'm there with a vision and a purpose. So he says God's instinct will bring them to God's provided place. He says, so does the Holy Church, Holy, excuse me, the Holy Spirit take the church to God's provided place. Not to join a church, but to be filled with his presence. To see his word made manifest, vindicated. That's God's provided way for the church always. So this is, a, this is commissioning us. This is setting us straight. This is giving us the right kind of purpose and vision for the people. This is God's provided way for the church, always for the people, to bring them to the place that God has provided for them. That's exactly what the church should be today. All right, catch it. We are not the place that God has provided to bring them, but we are placed so that we can bring people to His provided place, which is Christ. So that's the function we have. If it was just a matter of getting people to church, let's just all come up with some kind of gimmick, some kind of giveaway, some kind of raffle, some kind of lottery. Everybody right now, look under your seat. If you have the number seven, you just got a $700 gift card to anthropology. And we just all find all sorts of ways to get people to want to be there. But what we do as a church is we take people. God's provided way for the church is to bring others to the place that God has provided for them. That's exactly what the church should be today. The church is... Is responsible for lifting up Christ, preaching the word so that others find their place. And if that means God leads them to another church, we rejoice. If that means God uses them for his glory somewhere else, we rejoice because this isn't the ultimate placing. It's in Christ that we receive our ultimate placing. It is our responsibility to bring them to the place that God has provided, not a pew. And I believe that Christ has given us, as I said earlier, Christ has given us those two pence, healing and salvation, to serve with, to minister with, to lift up Christ. That's the right way for a church to grow. Brother Branham says in the message, letting off the pressure. I hope that that can serve as a balancing. I don't want to ever get out of balance in, in, in expressing this. We should go to church. We have to have a home church. Brother Graham said it very plainly a few places. You can't stay at home and be a Christian. 
You just can't. So we realize this, there's something about this that the word is sanctioned, the word is blessed. But if you get it out of balance, you're not going to be the right kind of Christian. In the message, letting off the pressure, he says, the waves can beat and baffle and sickness can come. Death can come, anything else, but you're safe evermore. Christ, our refuge, God's provided place of safety. I'm reading this to back up how Brother Ram says that, that God's provided a way for the church is to bring them to a place that God has provided for them. That's exactly what the church should be today. This is the place. This is the place where we lead. This is our, per, our responsibility as a church is to pr- bring people to this place of safety. Christ, our refuge, God's provided place of safety. Christ is the only place of safety for those who wants to live. He's the only one that has eternal life. There's no church, no denomination, no president, no king, no pope, no bishop, no minister. Nothing can give you safety but Jesus Christ. Therefore, we do not have at our disposal the threat that if you leave here, you're going to be lost. No, if you leave Christ, there's your danger. That's when you're going to lose everything. Nothing can give you safety but Jesus Christ. He's the only place that can give you safety. And he's God's provided safety. Oh, we can provide this and provide that and it'll fall. But when God provides anything, it's eternal. And that's God's provided way for our safety in Christ. I love it. When you're in him, when troubles come like sickness or worry, disappointment, he bore our sorrows. With his stripes, we're healed. Everything that we have needed for the rest of our journey is right here in the refuge. We don't even point to our own healing, our own salvation. What does Brother Branham say? It's remarkable when you listen to those tapes in the early years. Brother Branham says, I'm no healer. I can't heal you. And when he begins to talk like that, some people will be like, you you brought me here. You told me this guy was a healer. The reason why I'm here holding this prayer card is this guy's a healer. He says, I couldn't do nothing to heal you. I'm no healer. I'm no, I don't do that. And they're thinking, wait a minute. We're all here because you're the healer. He goes, no, it's Christ that heals you. I'm just a servant. I can just stand here and pray for you. I can just do what he tells me. I can just stand by the word of God. It's letting Christ have the preeminence, letting the word have the preeminence. And a church doesn't brag that it's got what you need to finish the job. But it realizes that in Christ, everything that we have needed for the rest of the journey is right here in the refuge. And when a church has welcomed Christ, the refuge, into its midst, it can say, we know the one who can carry you, who can heal you, who can strengthen you, who can encourage you, who has what you need. I want to close with this statement. This statement is just so challenging to me. He says, God... Let us take the opportunity while it's presented to us. They are depending on us. They left their word, the word of God that was shown to them. And it brings to mind that they without us could not be made perfect in this procession of believers through centuries. And how they did their part. And when they died, they passed the baton of the word of God. But then he says, they're depending on us to carry it out. You're running the last leg. You're going to be the ones that cross the finish line. He says, Jesus come to confirm it and to send the Holy Spirit to continue the work and to give us power to work by till these things be all finished. And then the great ransom church of the living God be caught up to meet him. There are some here today. Listen to his prayer. Oh, God, may it just become something that we can be captivated by. Listen to the prayer of this prophet. There are some here today, Father, who do not have this blessed restful hope in their souls. May this be the day that they will receive it. He says, there may be those here who've grown weary in the way. Let them know, Lord, that we never come to a picnic, but to a battleground. You fight every inch of the way. He says, give them courage, strengthen them. I think we've already pointed it out here before. It wouldn't just smack them upside the head. You know better than that. You know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, buddy. You didn't, this is, what did you think this message was, a picnic? No, it's empathizing. But think about those that have been grown weary in the way. Give them courage, strengthen them. There's some here that's been wounded, Lord. The enemy has shot darts of sickness into their bodies and afflictions. There are warriors, there are warriors laying here on the battlefield. 
that would be up and going if they could. Listen, catch this, catch this. Warriors laying on the battlefield. Warriors, these are my words now, in case someone is just listening, these are my words. Warriors that might even be, see me, laying out of church. Warriors who are not where they used to be or where they know they should be or where we think they ought to be. Warriors that are wounded, scattered, wounded sheep all over. Here they are laying, wounded. And they would be up and going if they could, but they must be taken to the end where the caretaker is to take care. They must be taken to the end. You can't just do a Facebook campaign and hope they get the message. We're having church. No, he says there's got to be something. They need somebody. They must be taken to the inn where their caretakers to take care. Father, may the ambulance of God carry them to a real genuine faith this afternoon. Grant it, Lord. Lord, let me be an ambulance driver. If there's a wounded warrior out there, there's wounded sheep, there's somebody who's scattered, somebody who's hurting, and they would be here if they could. Lord, let me go and take them. Let me go and take them to the inn where they can be ministered to. There may be those here who've grown weary in the way. Warriors laying in the battlefield, but they must be taken to the inn where they're to be taken care of. May you be inspired. May you be inspired to love your neighbor as yourself. Recognizing your individual responsibility. The collective responsibility that we have as a church. And say, Lord, we welcome you. We invite you. Let's stand to our feet tonight. Sister Cassandra, if you'd come, you could play that song in the key of C2. <clears throat> Actually, I think I see it singing the key of F. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Can we do a little? self-examination tonight I've, I'm not going to apologize but I will at least acknowledge that it might not have been as festive as some of us wanted <laughs> and the, the, when the jingle bells and the balls of holly and maybe we thought we'd all guess gather around tonight with our hot cocoa and some marshmallows and talk about the birth of Christ and I even realized as a way that I could try to characterize it that this was really hard and cutting. But I will say this. I know it is challenging. But I sense it's something you welcome. That there's actually a, a, a joy that's quickened within your heart to be challenged in this way. Because you're up for it. I believe you're up for it. And I believe you're capable of being the bearers of Christ's presence. So let us, as we pray, let us ponder as we bow our heads even now, as I'd like to go to the Lord in prayer. Say, Lord, I want to do my part. Let me be a little provided person in this little provided place. God is shaping us to minister. God is establishing us to welcome wounded, to minister to the hurting. God is establishing us to be prepared. To not be turned off. To not be, uh, I have a, the wrong kind of reaction, knee-jerk reaction to situations and circumstances. God is preparing us now. So let's say, Lord, I'm a willing vessel. Lord, here I am. Use me for your glory. Lord, strip away all pride and all prejudice, all bias, all pretense. Opinions that build barriers. And habits that push people away. And Instincts that are, that are offensive. Oh God, do a work in me. I'm a willing vessel. And as you're standing there tonight with your heart lifted up to Him, let's welcome Christ. Let's do it as a church. Lord, we're dedicating ourselves. As Brother Bram said, may it be a consecrated church and a consecrated people. Let's even consecrate as we will be gathering in, these, in this room. Lord, we consecrate this room to you. 
We consecrate this podium and the table and the piano and the instruments, the chairs. We consecrate our equipment. We consecrate our hearts. We're consecrating this place. We consecrate ourselves as individuals. May this be a consecrated place and a consecrated people that others will see Christ. Oh, maybe I, maybe I should apologize for not expressing it sooner that we should be consecrated. We should be consecrated to Him for His cause and His purpose. Let us pray, our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we consecrate ourselves to you now, Lord. Consecrated at this Christmas time. Consecrated with a purpose. Consecrated with the commission to love our neighbors as ourselves. And Lord, may we not, seeking to justify ourselves, narrow the definition of who our neighbor is. But may it be whoever we come in contact with, we will treat them as if we are treating Christ. We will to do to them what we would do to ourselves. Lord, I pray tonight as we have willing hearts here who are up for the challenge as we yield ourselves, may the sweet Holy Spirit come now and strengthen them and encourage them. Those that have grown weary in the way, the wounded warriors laying upon the battlefield, Lord, may you come, take them. Take them tonight, those who gathered here at the end, those that are streaming the service. Lord, take them with this ambulance to real, genuine faith, Lord. Strengthen us that we might be your servants. Lord, we don't always want to be in the hospital bed. So our prayer is, as you're witnessing to us, administering to us and strengthening us, and Lord, I want to be on the battlefield for you, Lord. I want to be an ambulance driver one day. Lord, I'm inspired by how this sister reached out and prayed for me. I'm inspired how this brother took his time for me. Here I am, Lord. I'm wounded. I'm being ministered to. I'm being witnessed to. But my desire is to not always remain in the bed. But, Lord, I want to go do likewise. So I pray, Lord, that you would take a hold of us for your glory. Heal our wounds and our scars, our complexes and our fears. Dress us up, pour in the oil and the wine. Take us who are hurting, who've been wounded, who've been bruised, scattered, but yet collected together here this evening. And heal us up and strengthen us and encourage us. Because, Lord, we're eager to go back out on the battlefield. May we no longer wounded, but, Lord, sensitive because of our scars and knowledgeable because of our past to do great battle for your kingdom. I pray that you consecrate us, consecrate this room, Lord. May there be a hedge about it. We bind spirits that would try to defile it. We pray that it would be a place consecrated and preserved till Sunday, Lord. Father, I pray for, that you would reach uh, those that you've ordained us to reach, Lord. Let us be willing to be hospitable and welcoming and inviting. And Lord, I pray we see souls saved. Restored ones. I pray for it, Lord. We collectively as a church believe that it will be. Bless us tonight as we worship, as we're soon dismissed, Lord. Thank you for your precious presence that's been with us. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray.